Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here again, and this time I'm going to talk about DNA and RNA structure. Specifically, we're going to be talking about how genetic material gets from one generation to the next, and we're going to be talking about the structure of the molecules as well. So here we go. So first off, let's describe the structures involved in passing hereditary information from one generation to the next. To do this, it's important to make note that we're going to be talking about asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction as sort of the two means of getting material from the parent generation to the next generation. So in both instances, we're going to have genetic material inside a parent cell. And so we'll be specifically looking at this from the case of DNA. So in asexual reproduction, you have an individual. They have DNA in that cell. They're going to make a copy of that DNA. And then they will split the cell in half. And each daughter cell will get an identical copy of that genetic information. So in asexual reproduction, it's very quick only involves one parent, and it's going to have a high conservation of the genetic material that was in the parent generation. We'll get to the daughter generation. In other words, there's going to be very little variation generation to generation from the process of reproduction. In sexual reproduction, we're going to have two separate parent cells. And those parent cells are going to take their genetic material, they're going to make copies of it, but then they're going to also divide it so they're only, only going to pass on half of that genetic information. This is going to be seen in the process of meiosis, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then that will then allow to have two cells, each that have half the genetic information, be fused together to form that next generation, which will be a zygote. Now, this is going to involve a lot more genetic variation because, again, we're only going to be passing on some of the genetic information of each parent to that next generation. And so when we see the combining of the DNA from these two parents, we're going to be getting a genetically unique offspring through the process of fertilization. So let's talk about DNA specifically. We'll also mention a little bit RNA as well. But DNA, when we talk about hereditary information, we're predominantly talking about DNA. In uh, cells, this is going to be the case. And so what we're going to see is that we have a cell. Uh, in this case, we're talking about a eukaryotic cell. We have inside that eukaryotic cell, we have a nucleus. Inside that eukaryotic cell, there is a DNA. During times of division, they will become visible like these X-shaped chromosomes. And if we were to zoom in deeply on that, that we would be able to see this double helix DNA structure. Now, as I mentioned before, in the case of sexual reproduction, what we will have is we'll have this in initial genetic information. It will then make duplicate copies of that information, go through a process of crossing over a synapsis, and then shuffle those chromosomes out so that while we have four chromosomes in the initial cell, we're only going to have two chromosomes in those daughter cells that are going to be fused together through the process of fertilization. This idea of taking DNA as our source of genetic information is going to go through that process to lead to the combining of different parents through sexual reproduction. If we wanted to highlight this as an asexual reproduction, what we would see is that after we had gone through the uh, duplication of the homologous chromosomes, they would just split and each daughter cell would get you know, two red and two blue single chromatids, just like it looks like in that first picture. And you'd end up getting two identical daughter cells. Um, and that would be the next generation. And that would be it. And that would just sort of be a mit mitosis or binary fission type division if we were talking about a bacterial cell. Now, the reason we talk about RNA as sometimes being the genetic information is there's a few different reasons. One, RNA is crucial in taking that DNA information undergoing transcription to form mRNA and then translating it into ultimately into proteins. So it would be uh, foolish to not acknowledge the role of RNA in actually taking that DNA information and leading it to ultimately getting to the proteins that will be active within those daughter cells. Additionally, there are other RNA molecules that are found that have regulatory components, whether those be microRNAs, and, and other forms of RNA that we can talk about in the form of gene regulation. But RNA definitely plays a role in which proteins are made in which cells, um, and that is going to be passed on from one generation as well as part of that regulatory sequence. And then lastly, up here, I have these seven examples of different classes of 
viruses. So we have all kinds of different classes as known as the Baltimore classification system. And we know that while viruses aren't alive, we do know that there are instances in which viruses will pass genetic information from one individual to another. And we will see that uh, viruses do play a role in having genetic material move from one individual to another in a few different instances. This is very complicated and is more like an exception to the general rule that we say DNA is the genetic information, but it would be uh, an oversimplification to say that DNA is the only hereditary information. And so I want to acknowledge that there is some uh, contributions of RNA both through viruses and through some regulatory sequences that also exist. Uh, if you're asked about those in more detail, uh, we'll give you some sufficient uh, background to help you parse that information. So let's talk a little bit about the genetic information and how it's transmitted from one generation to the next through DNA or an RNA. And then we want to make sure that we understand that how that's going to ultimately get to our, our central dogma. So we know that genetic information is stored in and passed subsequently uh, through the generations through DNA molecules. And in some cases, we see that RNA plays a role in these different components. And so, uh, again, we talk about DNA. If we have our DNA molecule and we make a copy of it through DNA replication, we'll see that starting our process of simple cell division that could be to asexual reproduction. You have a double-stranded DNA molecule. It goes through a process of uh, replication using DNA polymerase. We now have two copies of it. If this type of organism is then going to undergo asexual reproduction, those two cells split, and we end up getting uh, two identical daughter cells as a result, and that's a form of asexual reproduction. If we're going to undergo um, sexual reproduction, the duplicating of the DNA will then be followed up through the process of meiosis, as we discussed earlier, in which only half of that uh, genetic information is going to get into the gametes and those gametes will fuse. Once we have that fertilized cell, how is the genetic information from the first generation going to ultimately be expressed in that next generation? Well, regardless of whether it's been through the process of sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction, we know that DNA code is going to then undergo the process of transcription to form an mRNA and then translation to form a polypeptide or a protein. And that genetic information that started in that initial parent cell that was duplicated and then passed on either directly or following meiosis and fertilization, that genetic code of that first generation will be expressed in that next generation through the use of that DNA along with RNA to lead to the proteins that ultimately lead to the phenotype of that individual. Now, when we look at how that genetic information is transmitted, it's also important to note that prokaryotic organisms typically have a different structure to their genetic material. And so while we look over here on the right, and you can see that you have your eukaryotic cell, and at the moment you don't really see any chromosomes in there, um, and there. And then when we look at the prokaryotic cell, we see that there's a nucleoid folded chromosome, and that's in a nucleoid region. They have the DNA that's there. That's gonna be one large circular chromosomal molecule that's in that one particular region. In the case of eukaryotes, what will happen is that when division occurs, we will move from the cell over on the right, and it will look more like the cell on the left. The cell on the left is undergoing the early stages of prophase, and that's where the chromosomes become visible before the cell gets ready to divide. This would be true whether we're going to get ready to go through mitosis to go through simple asexual reproduction, or if we're going to go through uh, meiosis, and it's just prophase one where the formation of those first chromosomes, and then again, you don't see those X-shaped chromosomes until you get ready for division and you start to initiate either mitosis or meiosis. Now, in addition to the circular uh, chromosome that is the genomic chromosome that we see in prokaryotes, we will also see extra chromosomal double-stranded circular molecules known as plasmids. We tend to think of these as predominantly being found in prokaryotes or bacteria, but it, there are eukaryotes that also contain plasmids. So we will see that plasmids are not part of the main 
bacterial DNA, but there's these extra little loops. So how does this work? Well, again, we can use uh, genetically modified organisms and we can engineer these plasmids and then have the cells pick these up. But in the wild, the way these work is that uh, you will have two individual uh, bacteria. They may or may not even be part of the same species. They're just part of the same community. They will form a bridge that's between the two cells. We call this a, a sex pillus and we will form the bridge between them. And what you will see here is that the cell over on the left here has this extra loop of DNA and it is going to send a copy of this over to the cell that is on the right. When they've undergone this case where they have had conjugation and they have shared this genetic information, both of these cells as a result will end up having this plasmid in them. This is a way of increasing genetic diversity within a bacteria, even though they go through the relatively low genetic diversity producing asexual reproduction. Now, as I mentioned before, these don't actually even have to be same, part of the same uh, species. They're just part of the same community. There have been examples of different species of bacteria sharing plasmids um, but from one to the other. And what we'll see here as a result of this is that something like antibiotic resistance is often found on plasmids that allows for uh, the pumping out or the deactivating of a particular antibiotic can be shared from one individual to another. And that's how we will see spread even between different species of antibiotic resistance within a particular location. Uh, this is noteworthy specifically for hospital-borne infections. And we see these rises of antibiotic resistance. This mechanism plays a role in the sharing of these chromosomes. All right, so let's get into the characteristics of DNA that allow it to be used as the hereditary information. So you're probably familiar with this molecule here, the double helix molecule that shows here, has its typical sugar phosphate backbones, it looks like a twisted ladder, and then along the rungs of this we see bases. In DNA, we're going to talk about four bases, adenines, thymines, cytosines, and guanines. And we'll talk a little bit more about this base pairing in a minute, but we always see that the adenines pair with the thymines and the cytosines pair with the guanines. So let's get into the nitty gritty of this DNA structure. First up, we should note that the adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, or A, T, C, and G are all what we refer to as nucleotides. Nucleotides are all composed of a phosphate, a pentose or a five carbon sugar and a nitrogenous base. We will also note that there are going to be bonds that form where a new molecule will be added where the phosphate will target the three prime end. So as we're going to add the DNA molecules, we'll be constantly adding them to that three prime end of the molecule as we see here um, in this phosphodiester bond linkage to the next nucleotide um, in the molecule being shown how that next nucleotide would come in. Another thing to note, in addition to the fact that these are made up of nucleotides, is the fact that the molecules in the double helix run anti-parallel. And so what that means is that if you'll notice here, we have the five prime end up on the top and the three prime end on the bottom. And what we'll be seeing is that we're going to be building molecules in that five prime to three prime end, which means that if I wanted to add another molecule onto here, I would target this uh, hydroxyl down here and I would add another uh, nucleotide here moving in that, that direction. And then this is anti-parallel because if I look on the complementary strand, what I see is it goes five prime on the bottom up to three prime on the top. And so these are referred to as anti-parallel because it's going five prime to three prime in one direction, whereas the complementary strand is going five prime to three prime running in the opposite direction. It is important to note that you really only can add new nucleotides to these three prime ends. And uh, when we get into DNA replication, there's going to be some uh, consequences of this structure. Now, let's talk about the fact that we have some specific um, nucleotide base pairings that are conserved throughout evolution. So it doesn't matter what type of organism you find out there, you're going to see that adenines always pair with thymines on DNA, and they always pair with uracils if we're bringing in a complementary um, RNA, such as in the process of transcription. And that cytosine always pairs with guanine, um, on DNA. And again, that's true whether it's DNA or RNA. And so what we'll see here is there's a complementary basing that always occurs. Now, another interesting thing to note is that um, the 
AT pairing or the AU pairing is always going to form two hydrogen bonds. And that's actually part of the um, guaranteeing that the molecules are going to match up correctly because when they are running anti-parallel and the A's and the, uh, the uh, A's want to make a two base complement to the T's, what you're going to find is that the locations of where those hydrogen bonds are going to form are going to set up so that they want to find the location to make those two hydrogen bonds. If you were to bring in, instead of a T, you were to bring in a C, those hydrogen bonds don't match up because the molecules have different shapes, and A and the C would not be able to make those complementary hydrogen bonding moving in any direction how you set them up, and so as a result, they wouldn't form that. So this is a huge implication when we talk about DNA replication. When we pull the two strands of DNA apart and you have this open side that has the A on it, the complement that's going to be brought in is going to be the one that makes the two hydrogen bonds using the T. The same thing is going to be true when we talk about cytosines and guanines. Cs and Gs make three hydrogen bonds cutting across the two of them. And so again, if you had a C and you need to bring in the next base, you're only going to bring in something that's going to make that complementary hydrogen bonding of three complementary bases. It's going to be a only a G that's going to make those three bases. Even another C is not going to be able to make it. It would repel it. It wouldn't be lined up correctly to make those three hydrogen bonds. Uh, an adenine or a thymine is going to be looking to try to make two hydrogen bonds. And so they won't have a nice natural complement. Now, additionally, what you'll notice is that um, some of the structures that we have have double ring structures, namely the guanines and the adenines, and others have a single ring structure, and those are cytosines and the thymines and the uracils. And so those are called pyrimidines that have a single ring structure. The other impact of having these particular structures the way they are is that when they go to make their complementary basis, the distance between the two backbones is going to stay consistent because you're always having a double ring structure paired with a single ring structure. All right, a lot of these things play a role into why when DNA gets copied or when DNA gets uh, transcribed, you're going to see that the enzymes are going to have a consistency of always bringing in the appropriate pair because of the biochemistry of these molecules. All right. Well, I hope that was helpful. It was a lot of information on DNA structures, a lot of background chemistry, um, but I hope it was useful and I'll talk to everybody soon.